My guest today is Matt Haig. Now, Matt writes stories for children and adults, and he also writes nonfiction uh, that's very, very uh, revelatory and personal about his own life and torment and anxiety and other people's. And other people seem to find that it chimes with their lives um, in a really remarkable way. And Matt, I, just, I mean, did you, did you set out to write self-help books at all or, or is this just something that's happened no and I, i'm still i'm still slightly unsure if i have actually written a self-help book because i know it's categorized as self-help but for me self-help is someone having all the answers to a problem standing on top of the mountain and saying this is it i've got it all worked out follow me and i'm definitely not doing that because i don't have all the answers and but my incentive for writing the books about mental health was to sort of try and work things out and explore what I'm thinking. But I think what I think there's a comfort, especially with mental illness, in not feeling alone. So if a book gives someone that feeling that I didn't have when I was first ill, that they're not the only person. If they see an echo of their own experience, it doesn't have to be a book, it could be a blog, it could be a TV show, whatever, then it takes away some of that self-stigma of being this sort of freak with this invisible experience. Is it, is it painful or cathartic or what? You know, going through to that process it. and, and <laughs> revealing that? Well, I certainly thought it would be because it took me over a decade before I was comfortable. I'd written something like, not many people had read them, but I'd written about 10 books before um, the first time I, I wrote about it in Reasons to Stay Alive. And I wouldn't have written that book if a friend hadn't asked me to do it. I had a friend in London in publishing who, who said I should. And um, I, I was nervous about doing it, I was scared about doing it, I thought it would be painful to go back there. But the reality was, it was actually quite liberating and just externalizing that experience um, of a breakdown, of suicidal depression, panic disorder, which was my first diagnosis, putting it all on paper, um, didn't feel like I was going back anywhere because I think anyone who's been through any kind of trauma or traumatic experience, illness, grief, whatever, it's kind of all, always there to, to an extent. And so it felt more like a letting go than a, a sort of bringing in. And, I, you know, I think this is one of the reasons why talk therapy is always up there in studies on a par with um, prescription drugs, because you're taking an internal experience and you're making it external. So you're just kind of making it lose some of its power just by sharing it, whether it's written down or talking, you know, it's communication. In a podcast. In a podcast, here, yes. absolutely. This I mean, is a therapy <laughs> session. I'll send you the bill. <laughs> um, I mean, the, the latest one, Notes on a Nervous Planet. Um, mm. Why are we a nervous planet? Well, you know, nervous planet for two reasons. Uh, one, nervous in the sense that we are all stressed out and the rates of anxiety disorders are rising Ridiculously, you know, in the last 10 years, whether you look at eating disorders, rates of self-harm, um, rates of various sort of isolated anxiety disorders, they're going up. And it's not simply that we're talking about it more or that doctors are over-diagnosing or people are more in tune with it. Because actually, if you look at the figures, um, the areas where rates are rising fastest are still areas with massive amounts of stigma. And people are very uncomfortable. Teenagers are very uncomfortable of that you know, showing their parents self-harm scars. You know, there's lots of reasons for these things to be secret, yet these rates are rocketing way faster than we're breaking down stigma. So there is something about our contemporary culture and anxiety, certainly. So it's nervous planet in that sense, but also in the sense that we're all this connected nervous system now. And like our psychology is affecting each other in ways that it didn't before. Because we pass our anxieties on to each other. Yeah, we pass our anxieties onto each other, we're kind of overloaded. Um, there's, a, I read recently about Dunbar's number. There was this guy at Oxford University, Roger Dunbar, who came up with his number being 150, which um, 150 was roughly the size of hunter-gatherer communities. It was roughly the sizes of pretty much every village up until the 18th century. And 150 people is the sort of natural amount of people we're meant to have any kind of knowledge of within a lifetime you know, in terms of evolutionary terms. Now you can see 150 new people on Instagram before you get out of bed, just sort of scrolling through. So we're in a very different, I feel like we're this sort of old hardware, this sort of Commodore 64 hardware, trying to download the most sort of sophisticated 
software. And this is born from your own experience, isn't it? Largely of arguing yeah. with people on Twitter. And that, <laughs> everybody said, who I've said oh, I'm interviewing Matt Haig has said, ask him why he's always on Twitter. Yeah. And then writing about why well, this, Twitter is really bad for us. Well, this is why it's not self-help, <laughs> because I, I'm the one who needs the help. And I'm, I'm a hypocrite as well. But I have written a book. Um, I think I'd still use Twitter a lot, but I think I'm better than I used to be three years ago. It doesn't affect my mental health in the same way. I used to get into pointless, long drawn out arguments with people in Texas who I would never have met in any normal context. You know, they'd have a, a flag avatar or a gun avatar. And I just, you know, no one was gonna win that argument. Were you was, picking the arguments? Were they picking them with you? Well, they'd often come, you know, the, 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 the big first year where we thought, what is going on, like 2016, um, yeah, there was a lot going on, wasn't there? There's was Trump, Brexit bubbling, and um, everyone seems to be on Twitter shouting at each other. And so sometimes it was me, you know, going, you know, saying something to Donald Trump pointlessly, or you know, and then other people joined in. And um, yeah, occasionally it would it would affect my mental health, and it would sort of ruin a weekend. And I've got young children, and I, I would think, you know, what am I doing at my laptop with this sort of little wall made by Apple that's sort of blocking me off from my actual reality and why am I more caring about a guy in Texas that I'm arguing with? Did you work out one? <laughs> well <laughs> I, I worked out I shouldn't be and I worked out that you know I really should not be getting back to these people and to actually have some time away and I feel like it, it the internet is the most marvelous wonderful thing in the world. So I'm not, I'm not doing a big anti-internet thing, but it, it's like everything else, it's how we use it. And I don't think we've worked out how we should be using social media because it's such a new thing. You know, we had this sort of Cambridge Analytica awakening in terms of the political aspect, but I think psychologically and, and in terms of health, I don't think we're there yet at all. So how should we try to navigate it? Um, well, I, th I think we should be aware that you know, mental health is health. So anything that affects our mental health is a health issue. You know, I mean, people wouldn't give their children 20, um, you know, a packet of Marlboro a day. Uh, yet we're, we're willingly risking our own and other people's mental health with technology. And I think it's just simple things, working out, are you spending time on social media that you really don't want to be spending? on social media, how much time, simply getting those apps which tell you how much time you're spending was an awakening for me. And also not having my phone by my bed. I know not everyone can do that because they have it as their alarm, but plugging my phone in my kitchen, charging it overnight, um, meant I actually had to have some kind of normal rhythm where I'd get downstairs, have breakfast, we could just go back to having alarm clocks, couldn't we? I have this argument with my kids where they say, I, they, you know, I need my device because it's my alarm. And you go, well, it's fine. I'll wake you up. Yeah, have an um, alarm clock. You know, you don't need an alarm. Um, and you know they're lying. You see, because the, the thing, maybe that's just my kids, but I doubt it. I mean, <laughs> what, what your analogy of, you know, you wouldn't give 20 cigarettes to a child mm. is to say that all social media interaction if you're a child is bad, isn't it? Because there's no such thing as a good couple of cigarettes, they're all bad. Um, so is all social media interaction, do you think, basically anxiety inducing for young people who aren't equipped to deal with it? Potentially, but actually the people who are most gloomy about this, the, the gravest warnings about social media come from Silicon Valley. It comes from the tech gurus who are sending their kids to Steiner schools or schools without technology, which are booming um, in California. And they're coming from um, Tim Cook, CEO of Apple, who, who gave a talk saying he doesn't think teenagers should be on social media. It's coming from the guy who invented the Facebook like button, a guy called Josh Rosenstein, Josh something anyway. And he, he, he basically has a child lock on his own phone now because he thinks he's so addicted. Um, and yet we're, we're still not officially recognizing social media as an addiction. You know, the World Health Organization, they went for video games first, which was felt a bit of a soft target. But I, I, I think it is different. I think it's a health issue like cigarettes, but it, it's its own issue. So it's not quite like cigarettes. It's not like saying every single interaction is bad for you, but it's got the potential to be. And for young people, 
I mean, I, I quite like Instagram because it seems friendly and everyone's nice to each other. But for young people, and especially for girls and young women, Instagram, you know, always comes out as the worst, the one that stresses people out. And it, it, it's that I, it's just making you feel incomplete or insecure because you're looking at these better lives, fear of missing out, always imagining there's a sort of party that you're not at. You've got all these um, filters and apps like Facetune now, which are, are literally making perfectly normal looking people feel like they need to look like something that's impossible to look like. You had that case of a woman who went to her plastic surgeon saying, make my eyes like this Snapchat filter. And he said, I can't make human eyes bigger than they are. You know, we're not, you know, we're not nocturnal primates who are made to have <laughs> big eyes. And so I don't know, we're at a funny time where we're just being a natural normal human selves seems to be something that's not encouraged. You know, we've raised the bar so much of what we're meant to be like, and it's happening to men and young boys too now. It's always happened to women and it's worse than ever for women, but it's we're heading in the wrong direction for everybody. I mean, a, a lot of this ground is very well trodden, if you like, and discussed with, with regard to girls and teenagers. Mm. It's not as well discussed with regard to boys, is it? I mean, do you think there's a difference in the way these effects are playing out in gender? Well, yeah. I mean, I'd say they're both roughly heading in the di same direction. I mean, boys have still, you know, there's, I think the pressures still aren't quite as great as they are for girls and women. But there, there's something, uh, you know, it, um, called muscle dysmorphia, for instance, where boys are just getting more obsessed with having these sort of superhero Hollywood bodies and looking like they go to the gym all the time. And um, there are even apps that instead of changing your face, change your body and, and boys are sort of using that. Rates of eating disorders are going up, uh, have doubled in the last 10 years uh, among um, boys and young men. So it's, it's definitely something that is affecting boys and men, not necessarily to the same degree, but I think that anxiety around looks, self-acceptance, um, is, 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 yeah, rapidly rising. What do you think the, the relationship is between anxiety and depression? Uh, anxiety and depression, it, it, it's, it's hard because they're almost opposites when you look at the sort of descriptions of them, but you, they often coexist. So when I had um, anxiety and depression together, neither definition really made sense because, you know, the famous head clutcher pictures you see in the media of depression where you're sort of like got your head in your hands and, um, you know, you're just sort of sitting there and kind of moping and looking out the window. And that's the sort of image of depression. Whereas, whereas I definitely had depression, but my depression, because I had anxiety as well, it was very fast paced. So the thoughts were sort of going around at very fast rates in my mind. I'd be pacing around and yet I'd feel this sort of overwhelming, heavy sense of despair at the same time. So it's a very um, blurred area. I'd say anxiety generally is when you worry that everything's going to get worse, that you're, you worry about yourself, you, you worry about the, the future, you worry about the next five minutes, you, you worry about your mental health. Whereas the depression is sort of like a, a grim, bleak, pessimistic acceptance that nothing's going to get better. You're sort of at the point, you're not even worried about the future because you're just at that, bottom point. So with me, the anxiety would often come first and the panic attacks and everything else, and I'd get exhausted with that. And then you'd reach a state of depression and despair at the bottom of it. And, and the thing I wish I could go back, if I could go back in time two decades and tell my um, younger self anything, I would say that that state of total depression and total fear is not permanent. You know, that was what made me suicidal, the idea that I had no idea how I'd got into that situation. So I had no idea how to get out. And I was 24 years old. So I thought, I'm going to be like that forever. And that didn't happen. It, um, you know, even though I went a very long winding route, I didn't find the right pills for me. I, I tried various doctors and dead ends. I held on long enough to understand that the stuff that my mind was telling me wasn't reality. You know, the one thing bigger than depression is time. And the reason we have that cliche about time healing is because time has that power to sort of 
place you in a different reality. So for instance, I was convinced I'd be dead at the age of 25. If for some reason I had managed to stay alive, I'd be in a straight jacket somewhere. My partner would have left me this, that and the other. And obviously some bad things happen to you in life, but that view that depression gives you of no possible light, you know, no possible hope or optimism was wrong. So in a very weird way, depression made me an optimist because it made me realize the pessimism I was feeling was wrong. Did it come from nowhere? Or had you always had those sorts of feelings? <sighs> it felt like it came from nowhere. Now with hindsight, I can see that it didn't come from nowhere. And I, I, I was a very, I had all sorts of issues of anxiety and low self-esteem. And, you know, I, I'd been a bit of a troubled teenager. I, I drank too much, I'd taken drugs. Um, you know, I hadn't been healthy. Uh, I was an absolute nervous wreck the year before I had my breakdown. Um, I was living in London. I was having sort of job interviews here and there. And I'd be standing outside um, as some advertising agency or something and not able to go inside just because of the sort of fear and I, I didn't really understand it and so I was having panic attacks without realizing it but typical young man thing I was sort of masking it with alcohol and I, I would have said I was a fun relaxed easygoing person but that was because I didn't really understand myself at that age and it took a, a point where I couldn't ignore it. You can't ignore a nervous breakdown. I, uh, you know, everything became hard. You know, putting on your socks in the morning became hard. The choice of everything became so hard. And this is why I think, you know, modern life ha has a role in this because we're in this age now of infinite choice, of infinite decisions, micro decisions that we're not even thinking about. But our wor world is so overloaded with stuff, whether it's, you know, what to watch on Netflix, um, what news channel to watch, whatever it is, we've got infinite choice over everything. And um, I think choice itself can be actually paralyzing and can be quite stressful. So I can remember those little decisions like what to wear or, you know, which room to go in or, you know, whether to go out of the house. They would be like paralyzing. And, you know, the places I had panic attacks like um, supermarkets and the corner shop would be places where you, you've got all these sort of brands sort of screaming for attention and um, artificial light and everything. So it felt very related to modern existence in some ways. I mean, what should we do about choice? Um, because, again, this, this, is, this is like a sort of uh, a, a relatively common argument in my household about <laughs> choice, you know, um, in that, I will quite often say, what do you want to do? And, and again, the, the choice can be paralyzing because there are so many yeah. different things that you can do. And my wife will tell me often say, don't ask them what they want to do, tell them what they're doing. And, and, I, and, I, and, and I sort of go back to that whole thing of, but don't children want autonomy and they want to make their own decisions. They don't want to be you know, bullied all the time and all the rest of it. So you've got to strike this balance between letting Yes. Young people grow and take decisions for themselves and not letting them be bombarded with choice. Yeah, and I don't know if any, anyone gets that balance right. I know it's a totally subjective thing. I mean, I, I just know in a personal individual level, um, you know, often the answer to things is, is stripping things away. In my own life, it's often st stripping things away. You know, people, when they want a solution for something, they think, oh, I've got to add something new in my life. But normally it's about editing. And if you look at the trends now, whether it's Marie Kondo, whether it's veganism, dry January, whatever it is, a lot of these things that people think are enhancing their lives, it's about stripping things away. We're kind of like this cluttered song where we want to find the sort of acoustic version of ourselves. And yeah, it becomes a point where too much freedom actually isn't freeing. Uh, I can't remember which brand, there was some sort of mega monstrous brand like Unilever or something, but they, they did a test with shampoo where they had, um, two different stands of shampoo, one with 17 different brands of shampoo and one with three. And they actually worked out, they sold less when there was a choice of 17 than there was the choice of three. So there comes a point where choice isn't actually freeing and it's not actually enabling us to do anything. It's like with the, with the news and the politi political stuff, this idea that we have to constantly be on Twitter every five minutes to be up to speed with every Donald Trump tweet or Brexit happening all the time. You know, you know, back in the 1970s, people got their news 
twice a day and they still got rid of Nixon and things happened. And we, we often feel paralyzed, even though we've got all this information coming in. And anxiety happens when you've got no control over a situation, when you've got the fear, but you don't have any ability to do anything about the fear. You know, we have anxiety for good reasons. You know, if it was a danger, if it was a threat, a pack of wolves, a bear or whatever, then you would either face the threat or flee from the threat. And, and often we're just stuck looking at the danger and not able to do anything or feel like we can't do anything. So the danger is we lose the ability to survive. We lose the ability because to we become anxious about we become nothing. Anxious, yeah, we become anxious about you know, you know, we're not we're looking out of our cave now and we're looking at you know every horrific thing that's happening in the world, and um, there's only a degree that we can do beyond sort of voting and caring about our you know. I mean, this is the definition sure. of a first world problem, isn't it? And 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 first world problems are denigrated as pointless and useless and not really problems, but. That's not really true, is it? Because well, this is a problem. Yeah, and it's a health issue. And I feel like if we understood that mental health, if we had parity between mental health and physical health, then I think that would be less of an issue because there's certain physical conditions that could be considered first world physical problems. You know, certain cancers happen more, say, in some continents than other continents. And, you know, there's, a, there's a, an aspect to the developed world uh, you know, in, that affects our physical health, whether it's air pollution, whether it's, you know, uh, diet, um, obesity, whatever it is. And I think the same, no one would say, oh, you know, having heart disease because of obesity is a first world problem, even though it is potentially a first world problem. It's, it's the same issue and it's life threatening as well. But, you know, depression and anxiety exists everywhere in the world and it is cultural you know the rates change and things shift about and you look at suicide rates to see how cultural it is you know some parts of the world have you know rates 24 times higher than other places but um it's not about saying oh it's worse somewhere it's not worse necessarily now in the developed inverted commas western world than it has been before but we have got a specific range of cultural related problems that we could be tackling and doing stuff about and it's not it's not just about ending with mental health if you start with mental health it actually impacts everything else because even something like as uh, as seemingly unrelated as climate change or the environment you know it turns out that a lot of the things that are actually bad for our minds and our psychology are also the same things that are killing the planet and destroying the earth. So there could be a bit more of a holistic thing about just viewing the world from a perspective of a mind. And I think, you know, there's an argument that we, we became detached from nature in the agricultural revolution and then again in the industrial revolution and now in the information age even more so. And that detachment, that idea of progress has actually you know, in some ways, psychologically, been a regress of taking ourselves away, away, away from our evolutionary self. So how much is it my fault? It's, it's 100%. You know, I, it's 100% your fault. <laughs> uh, well, I mean, we spend an awful lot of time <laughs> trying to grab people and go, this is a really big problem and you should care about it. Yeah. Um, and you, you should be worried about it. And you're right. And it is. And we have to... We have to you have to report the news and what's happening in the world. And people have, you know, I think sometimes it's very easy to think, you know, this trend for mindfulness and stuff is often translated almost as a selfishness, that we should just switch off and not care about the world. Actually, we need to actually care more in some ways. We need to reconnect. But, you know, it's about finding an issue that really you can do something about. Uh, you can't, we can't individually save the world in its entirety, but there are things that we can do to make other people's lives better or make our own lives better or help. Um, and it's about finding those things because that actually has a selfish benefit. It actually makes us feel good to be good and it makes us feel connected to the world. And it's a way out of our own mind and our own anxieties by caring for other people. So I think it's absolutely more important than ever to care about the world and we've got all sorts of stuff going on that is very very stressful but one of the ways to make ourselves less stressed is actually to do to do more in a way maybe not consume as much horrific information every five minutes but to actually act upon it
do things instead of yeah, do sitting things. there on yeah, so, so yeah, and not, and not just it. not just arguing with the guy in Texas, you know, actually try and help. Um, do you, do you think young men and boys don't know what depression is and therefore don't say they are depressed? Um, I think it's probably it, getting a bit better, but. Um, because the figures just don't make any sense, do they? The sort of the, the, the difference between suicide rates in young men yeah. and the way depression is reported between yeah. men and women doesn't make sense. No, and the really scary thing is a lot of the people who die by suicide haven't actually sought any kind of help. You know, they, they haven't had any, you know, they've, they've died essentially in most cases of an illness, of a health condition, and yet they've seen no one for that health condition. And it's got to the point where it's fatal. And they haven't seen anyone, and that to me is a, is a scandal because it's something we can do something about. You know, suicide rates fluctuate almost more than any other health condition. They fluctuate. They fluctuate famously between genders, but also between eras, between countries. So it is very much cultural, and it's very much to do with stigma. It's very much to do with patriarchy and masculinity and the idea of men as these sort of successful go-getters who had, you know, and, and that's given men massive socioeconomic benefits. But emotionally, it's meant some men have felt that they have to keep, you know, things wrapped up and closed off. And so I think if we, if we started to look at the sort of psychological aspects, it would be freeing in all kinds of ways. And it would, it would, it was, you know, it's not my place to talk about it, but it'd probably be a, a kind of have feminist results because um, it, would, it would mean that men feel like they don't need to be earning X amount and being the sort of outward person who goes out into the world. And I definitely think it's to do with men um, unable to talk about it. And I was one of those men. I was, I was rubbish at talking about it with my male friends. I was incredibly lucky that I was in a, in a strong relationship with my partner and I could talk to her. So I had someone, I had a valve. But with my friends, I'd just make up excuses. I'd never talk about it. I was so scared of the word depression and anxiety. I think part of that was the story I had, had in my head of depression and anxiety, which was that it ended in suicide because all the sort of examples I had in my head at that time, 20 years ago, were either famous dead writers like Hemingway or Sylvia Plath, Kurt Cobain, you know, it, it was the idea of a tortured artist, the idea of, you know, too beautiful, too sensitive for the world, and, and that's where you end up. And it's a totally wrong, false narrative. And I think one good thing about um, nowadays, and maybe even a good thing about social media and the internet, is it's given everybody a voice. So I would no longer think that. I would think, I would think of lots of people that I actually know in my own life and online and in the media who, yes, they've had depression, yes, they've had anxiety, suicidal thoughts, whatever it is, but they live with it, they manage with it, they recover from it, they survive and they know happiness despite it. So do you think we're getting better at it then? Because, I mean, and do the statistics bear that out? I, I, I think, no, they don't necessarily bear it out. I think, that is getting better. I think the aspect of not feeling alone when you're ill, which shouldn't be underplayed, is getting better. I think I'm wary before I say that we are getting beyond the stigma because even though we're talking about it, the way we're talking about it reveals that we still treat it as different to other health issues. For instance, if a celebrity um, talks or shares an experience about depression or suicidal thoughts, I can remember recently Victoria Pendleton doing it often in the newspapers, they'll use the language of confession. So it'll be Victoria Pendleton admits this, you know. And I think we have to get beyond that language of admits. And also, do, I... Do you think we've even got anywhere towards really getting over it, though? You know, do you think we read those articles and think oh, the same old thoughts, that you know, well, nutter, you know, mad or, you know... Yeah, I mean... In I, truth, you know, isn't there... A, it always strikes me there's a bit of fakery going on around this whole conversation around mental health. Yeah. At the moment, there are lots of people want to talk about it and say, yes, we should definitely talk about mental health and we should definitely do more about it. Yeah. While secretly thinking... Well... Yeah, but they're mad. 
Yeah, well, what I find interesting is a lot of people, a lot of people that I'd align myself with, you know, people who think of themselves as liberal and progressive uh, on, on other issues would be using mental health as a slur. They'd say, oh, have you not taken your meds today? They would, they would diagnose Donald Trump with mental health problem. And, you know, Donald Trump may or may not have a mental health problem. And I'm not sticking up for Donald Trump. But if you're using a mental health slur for Donald Trump, you're not stigmatizing Donald Trump. You're stigmatizing everybody with that health condition. And I'm not saying I've been perfect with that in the past, but I'm just saying it, 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 it's still there in our language. And also what I find particularly upsetting is when we stigmatize the act of getting help. I mean, the tabloids are still, you know, 20 years on from bonkers Bruno in the sun. Tab the tabloids are still amazing at this. You know, like if Ben Affleck is going to rehab, rather than reporting that as a, a, as a positive story, which it should be in someone's life, it's the moment they admit they need help and they're on the journey to recovery. It's always the moment of shame is the moment you've actually took the brave step to say, I need help. Um, and, you know, I, I, I can't remember which newspaper it was, but I saw a headline recently about snowflake kids get lessons in meditation from nine years old. And, you know, that, that's a, a good thing. They, those same papers would be up in arms if those schools stopped physical education. And yet, you know, we are mental as well as physical and it's all connected. Do you, do you believe any of the political conversation around this? When they say, you know, we, we want to give mental health the same priority as physical health and the same courtesy and thought. Well, I, I believe that it's good words and it's good they're saying them, but they would mean something more if at the same time they weren't cutting the number of mental health nurses. I mean, if you look at the, the last decade, there's been thousands of cuts of mental health nurses and yet more and more conversation about mental health. So I think mental health is, is almost like a feel-good sort of sidecar issue that, that politicians like and they feel like it earns them warmth and a, a, an idea of progressiveness without actually doing that much about it, partly because it's such an abstract, misunderstood thing. So as they're talking about it, I think in a way they're underlining the stigma still there because it's still seen as this fluffy thing, which isn't that important. We can talk about it, but not actually change that much. You write children's books and adult books. I mean, wh why do you write the children's books? Are they, are they a sort of a, a nice distraction? Yeah, like. well, I have, time almost. I have children, for one thing. But yeah, I think after I wrote Reasons to Stay Alive, I embarked on a trilogy of books about Father Christmas because I was literally trying to write the opposite book to what I'd written in terms of mental health. So my son had said, oh, what was Father Christmas like as a child? And I didn't have an answer. And I thought, oh, I'll write a book about that. So I wrote a book called A Boy Called Christmas, which was a way of cheering myself up. So yeah, it's kind of escapist. Although um, I also wrote a book called The Truth Pixie, which is a kind of mental health, self-help book for seven, eight, nine-year-olds. But you can't give those seven, eight, nine-year-olds a self-help book about mental health. So it's a book about pixies and owls, which also has themes of self-acceptance and accepting your own truth. But they don't necessarily know that they, I'm, I'm sort of hypnotizing them. Um, via Pixies and Elves. Well, tell, tell us about The Truth Pixie. I mean, I actually listened to it in the car this morning um, and, and really enjoyed it. <laughs> um, so so what, what's, it, what's it about? The Truth Pixie is about a, 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 a pixie who has this condition where she, she can only um, tell the truth and it gets her into all kinds of trouble because people, um, elves and trolls particularly, don't like to hear the truth. So she's... Um, thrown away by this troll and she lands in Helsinki and there's this troubled young girl called Arda who um, is moving house, her grandmother's poorly, her dad's lost his job, got, you know, all the stresses that children may encounter going on simultaneously and the truth pixie can't comfort her because she can only tell the truth and she says, yes, these bad things are going to happen. So she, she digs deep and, and finds a truth for this girl. So she will accept that bad things happen, but also you just wait because all these good stuff, all this good stuff is going to happen to you. And you've got an Oscar winning reader. Yeah, well, yeah, that was quite good timing <laughs> because yes, it's um, Olivia Coleman herself. And it was, it was very fluky how he got her. It was very, there was a lot of toing and throwing 
between my publisher and her people. And her people were definitely saying, oh no, she's not gonna have time in her schedule to do this, but she read the book, she liked the book. I think she'd read um, Reasons to Stay Alive as well. And she wanted to do it and all the proceeds were going to UNICEF. And so she just, on her day off, she went into a booth and did the audio book. So I'm, I'm very, yeah, still in a bit of shock about it. It's a nice, nice thing to happen. You mentioned your kids. You, you, you also homeschool your kids. Mm. Um, and without invading their privacy, I mean, just talk us through why, why you do this. Well, partly it's because of where we live. We live in Brighton, which, you know, is obviously the epicenter of every sort of countercultural thing. And so there are a lot of homeschoolers in, in Brighton. There's something like over a thousand children are homeschooled where we live. So it's quite an easy, it's homeschool light. We can go out to a maths group. We're not having to teach everything. You know, maths, art, this morning we had a drama group. There's always a group that they can go to. So we, we, we're, we're privileged in, in terms of where we live, but we can do it quite easily. And also in terms of our jobs. Um, I think also, you know, I mean, me and my wife both had issues with our education, like lots of people do. I come from a family of teachers, so it was a bit of a controversial decision, although my mum, who was a head teacher for 20 years, is, is behind it now and sends us stuff. Um, and it's definitely not right or doable for everybody, but Touchwood, it's, it seems to have made our children, you know, have less anxiety issues than they were having before. and. They seem comfortable in their own skin. So we're playing it by ear. And we haven't always done it. It's only been the last sort of two and a half years we've done it. Um, but at the moment, it, it's working. But it and is and amazing that they're still able to form relationships with other children and yes. converse with other yeah, people. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, they've got yeah. the social... Yeah, everyone worries about the social side. But they have the social elements. Again, probably partly because of where we live. And, you know, also it's increased their confidence with adults and everything. So the, you the, the worry is, I am a bit. I mean, the worry is if when they are older, you know, something goes wrong and they have issues in their life, we won't be able to pass the book and say it was the school's fault or it was this, you know, everything is down to us. So it's, it's like literally we are the go-to thing to blame. So that's frightening. I wouldn't say, I'm not like, I don't get on my soapbox about it. It's not, you know, as I, I don't, I don't know. I don't know. I mean, I, 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 in my heart of hearts, I believe in state education and, you know, that sort of stuff. And I'm from, a, as I say, a background, a family of teachers. I'd probably be a teacher if I wasn't a writer. So I'm not soapboxy, but yeah, I mean, it, it's, I believe that people should do what they think is right for their own children. How did you become a writer? Well, partly because of the mental health stuff, because when I was really deep in depression and anxiety, I was quite agoraphobic. So I literally had to stay at home. I couldn't have gone out and done a nine to five office job. So um, I, I, we were in lots of debt. It wasn't the sensible thing to do, but I thought, I know, I'm gonna make money writing books, <laughs> which didn't go down well with anybody. And for a long time, that didn't happen. But um, yeah, I, I became a writer because I needed to do something I could do at home. I couldn't design websites. I couldn't illustrate or do anything else. So what had plan A been? Oh, I hadn't really been a plan A. I mean, plan A when I was eight years old was to be in Duran Duran. And then I wanted to be a graphic designer just because I heard someone say it and it sounded like a grown up thing. But there hadn't really been a plan A. But I would have, I wanted to be a writer if I felt like I could have been. But again, I had no confidence. But I've seen you talk about how you felt almost like the posh kid at school um, because you had middle class yeah. parents. Yeah. So wh where were you headed, do you think, as a kid? I, mean, I don't know, because I, I think I was heading towards a breakdown, which is where I ended up. But I, I you know, up until the age of 24, I was quite lost. So I'd, I'd gone to university, then I'd done a master's degree. I was putting off adulthood for as long as possible. So I'd done English and history, and then I'd done a master's degree in English. And then I had a series of dead-end jobs. Um, they weren't necessarily dead-end jobs, but I made them dead-end jobs. They lasted only three weeks. I worked in a wine shop. I did media sales, selling advertising space for the Press Gazette. I did oh, all, all, oh, selling printer cartridges, you know, the the, character building stuff and 
I, but I had no, this is what's so weird about my younger self, because now I, I'm, I'm quite single-minded. I'm probably too ambitious. I'm too focused and too intense about everything. But back then, I was just sort of floating around, thinking about the night in the pub and not, you know, not going on it. And it was because I think I wasn't very in tune with who I was or what I was feeling. But when you say, you know, you, the, the note you would write to your younger yep. self is that it goes, it passes. You know, you don't, you, you know, you don't have to end up like this forever. Um, where, where, you know, how do you know? Well, you don't know when you're in that moment. You know, I still don't know if I'd have handed my younger self reasons to stay alive, whether any of those words would have actually... Would you have believed through. yourself? I mean, you know, I have no idea. All I, all I know is when I was writing that book is I wasn't trying to write something academic. I wasn't trying to write the last, words, last word on depression. I was literally trying to pull someone back from a cliff edge because I nearly did actually do that. And, and we lived on a cliff edge uh, in Spain. And I, I try and just think of the, the simplest way to get inside that person's head. And I think, especially when you're young, the trouble is, you have no understanding of the fluctuations of your own mind. You know, even if you have no one in your life at that moment, I still think that the reason to stay alive is other people. Other people that you haven't met yet, but also other selves that you haven't become. You know, my favorite word at the moment is a, quite a sciencey word. It's neuroplasticity, which means how your brain changes shape and structure through experience and through living. You know, we become different people at different times of our lives. And I think at 24, when you're in your first, you know, when you're having a, a kind of premature midlife crisis and you're hitting this big wall and um, you're having a breakdown, it's impossible to see that. You think this feeling is going to last forever. So, you know, what I would try and do is hack into that brain and say it's not. And the only way I managed to get better was I held on long enough to get some kind of fluctuation. So even now, if even now, if I start to feel worse, I try to be my own therapist and say, well, that's a fluctuation. And so that's a good thing. That shows things can change. It shows that it's going to get better again. So the metaphor I always use, and it's one I used in the book, is about the sky. You know, if 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 there's a black cloud over your head, that doesn't mean that the sky is the black cloud. The sky is the sky and it's sort of framing everything. And you might walk, you know, down the street and you might feel the rain, but you, you're not the rain. So it's about that understanding that it's an experience. It's not something you are, it's something you experience. And this is why I hate, and, and you know, like Piers Morgan or whoever it is, is always sort of talking about snowflakes and manning up and talking about mental strength rather than mental health. The thing that really, gets me irritated about that is it, it's so ignorant because actually I was never stronger than when I was dealing with panic disorder and anxiety. But at that time, walking to the corner shop was like crossing the Himalayas. It was like this massive expedition where I had to fight all kinds of things mentally to do that, to walk out the house and stop having agoraphobia. But for someone who doesn't, hasn't experienced that, it's easy to think, oh, well, what, what's the matter with you? Pull yourself together. Whereas actually those people that might, through some people's eyes, look like weak or, you know, like it's a character flaw. My character was formed through that experience. I was never stronger than the day I was scared to walk to the corner shop but did it. Could your friends and family have helped you? And what can friends and family do to help? Well, they did. I mean, my my... My girlfriend and my parents um, helped keep me alive, really. And they had no expertise. They weren't doctors. They had no, well, my mum did have direct experience, but it wasn't one she was talking about much then. And I think having someone I could literally talk to made the symptoms less acute when I was sharing them. Um, because it was, it was people I didn't have to wear the mask. You know, what I think the danger is where you have to keep a front, keep a smiling face to the world 
when you're feeling like hell and you can't tell anyone. I think that's when it becomes dangerous. That's when people turn to alcohol or drugs or whatever. And I was very lucky that, you know, I, I had quite liberal, open-minded parents who accepted it, who, who let, let us live with them. Um, there were things I, I think I could have done that would have made me recover quicker. But I, I now, at the age of 43, I wouldn't change a thing in terms of how I got there. Because even though I went the long hard way, I, I actually began to understand in great detail all the things that made me feel worse and all the things that made me feel better. So it was a long, painful education, but I'm, I'm better equipped because of it. It's interesting you come back to you. And I'm sort of asking you what, what tips you can give those of us who may have friends and family who are suffering anxiety. Well, I think, I, yeah, I, I think, I, yeah, I always struggle with this question. Do you think you question. can? I mean, you know. I always struggle with this question. I mean, I think it really is a subjective experience, but I, I think listening is, is, is essential and just not feeling guilty. Um, for two reasons. One, because it's not anyone's fault. And I think Freud has got a lot to answer for in this case. Like, parents automatically feel guilty about if someone's got mental health issue. Whereas, if it's a physical health condition you've inherited for whatever reason, there's not the guilt there. But with mental health, it's surrounded by guilt. My parents are still uncomfortable sometimes. If, if they come to my events and stuff, but they're still uncomfortable about me talking about it. And that guilt's not helpful for them and it's not helpful for the person. So I, I feel like not feeling guilt, but just actually genuinely being there for them, listening to them, offering advice, researching, learning about it, and um, you know, providing examples, experiences, anecdotes of other people who've gone through it. What I was so hungry for was to know that I would be okay. And the only sort of people I believed who could tell me that were people who'd been through it. Um, let, let's come back to the nervous planets and some tips for you know, surviving the nervous planets, if okay. you like. Um, to change the nervous planets, ways to change the nervous planets, let's call it. Um, <laughs> what should we do? I mean, things I'm trying to do. I've mentioned about my phone. I've switched off my notifications as well. I think switching off notifications that you don't need. Go on a kind of app diet, getting rid of the apps and your thing. Just making everything um, as simple as possible. Um, you know, I'm quite lucky in that I don't have to get out of bed at a certain time. So I, I can sort of live in natural rhythms. The thing I've really found most beneficial, I do things like exercise and yoga and all that stuff, and that's, that helps me deal with stuff. But um, the thing I didn't realize when I was first ill, which I realize now, um, is how important sleep is and quality of sleep and length of sleep. And I, I'm quite a bad sleeper, always have been a bad sleeper. But I'm, I'm in bed now at um, half past 10, almost every night. I try and be in bed way before midnight, whereas I used to sort of like go to bed at one o'clock and you know just stay up. And we're increasingly encouraged to, to stay up. The head of um, Netflix, Reed Hastings, said last year that Netflix's main competitor is sleep. <laughs> he was tongue in cheek, but he was also meaning it. He was thinking, if we can get people to watch episodes. I thought that was Newsnight. Um, <laughs> but... <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but they do it. If Netflix is actually, you know, that's, that's, probably, that's probably a single, that's a health issue, we're not sleeping. Anymore. <laughs> but um, no, and also, you know, have the blue light from phones and screens, it all affects our sleep. We sleep an hour less than we did 50 years ago. and. You know, sleep, sleep's important, but no one makes money from our sleep, apart from, you know, duvet manufacturers. I ask everybody, you know, what, what's the hardest thing that we could try and do that, uh, you know, that would really sort of dramatically make the world a better place? If you could sort of wave a magic wand, what do you think it would be? Would it be, would it be no social media or no, you know, the, the, the mobile phone, you know, delayed for another, 100 years or 200 years. Yeah, I think we'd stop our obsession with progress. If you look at, I think if, if we understood ourselves as animals, not to get too hippy dippy about it, but you know, if we understood ourselves, homo sapiens as animals, as the third chimpanzee, and got over this idea 
of progress, a story of progress, which is getting us into all kinds of trouble and actually realize that we, we haven't fundamentally changed in tens, if not hundreds of thousands of years. And yet our world is changing so fast. And I think it's addressing that disconnect, which is obviously not very easy to do. But the, you know, the, the, fur, the more we can actually be in tune with our natural psychological needs, it would be good for us, it would be good for other people, it would be good for each other, but it would be good for politics, it would be good for the world, it would be good for the environment as well. Everything but connects. <laughs> but hey, thank you very much indeed thank you, for coming in and sharing your ways to change the world. I really enjoyed that.